about enjoying your lunches. It is my distinct honour to introduce our featured speaker for this lunch. I was wondering actually why I was asked to introduce our speaker. Because until yesterday, I actually never met him. Unlike many people in this room, I suspect I have also never served with him. I have never worked with him on one of his uh, often extraordinary um, civil rights activism projects. I've never worked with him in the media. Although I should say a big thank you to him for being the first person ever to interview me on TV since I became a, a liberty guy. So thank you for that. Um, but then I thought, uh, it probably doesn't matter that I don't know Nadwa because, of course, Adam Kokesh is a man who honestly needs no introduction, right? There are many libertarians who have a lot to say. Uh, there's a lot of talk, but they don't walk the talk. I think a lot of us have seen that, right? Um, I am particularly intrigued by those who all uh, get very upset about their Second Amendment rights being taken away. Um, and they explain very fervently that we need the Second Amendment to stand up against the tyrannical government. And then in the next breath, they tell us about the tyrannical government. And I always ask them why they're still here and not in Washington, D.C. I'm answering. <laughs> well, Adam Rakesh <laughs> walks the talk. And I've got to say, I respect him for that more than anything. He just did, by the way, four months of time in defense of your Second Amendment right, and therefore, of course, in defense of your right. And just in case he didn't get the message, they put him in solitary for two months, because he's high profile. Well, thank you for being so damn high profile in defense of liberty, Adam. We appreciate it. A little more frivolously, he was also responsible for the dance at the memorial of the dancing president Jefferson. Did you know that Jefferson was the dancing president? I just learned that he was. So not only is he defending your second amendment, he's defending your first. He is a man, obviously, of uh, great courage, commitment, and consistency. So for that, Adam, again, thank you. Please welcome with me, Mr. Adam Kokesh. It was very therapeutic of me to take my 
traumatic experiences and, and use them for good, to be able to spread a positive message and to not just be against the war, but to turn that against militarism. And as Brother mentioned, uh, a lot of you might be familiar with some of the more obvious public points of my activism. But now, after eight years plus uh, of, of full-time activism, uh, I actually started in high school. And like, I, no joke, the reason I became a libertarian was simply as a punk kid. Wait a second. Republican or Democrat, you mean I have to be totally freaking lame, I don't have a choice? There's gotta be an option, right? This is America. All right, all right, I'll be a libertarian. It took me 10 years to understand what that really meant. But now, coming to events like this, I hear from a lot of people that what they appreciate about my activism is how it's changed, how it's evolved. How my perspective's changed. And sadly, it's a rare thing in politics, in activism of, of any kind. Most public figures who come out and become public figures with a certain ideology or set of positions are sort of trapped in that. Oh, if you change your mind, you must be a flip flopper. An unprincipled compromiser. You don't stand for anything. And man, it, it really hurts to hear libertarians say this about non libertarians. Because if we want to change the world, we need people to change how they think, right? And I mean, you all know the difference between a status and a libertarian, right? About six months. It's faster now with the internet, right? Now it's like a weekend of watching YouTube videos and reading Wikipedia articles. It's accelerated. People are waking up faster and faster, and we get to be in a position to encourage this. You know, when I first started with Rock Runners Against the War, I was that, you know, while well, I'm not a Democrat, not a Republican, libertarian. Not very thoughtful, not philosophical not principled or ethical or anything like that. And I ended up uh, coming out in that regard first as a constitutionalist. And it's funny how that seems to be a big hang-up for a lot of people on their journey down the rabbit hole, like a ledge sticking out from the side. You think you've gotten to the bottom, but you haven't. By the way, the only point to which you're wrong is when you think you've gotten to the bottom of the rabbit hole because one of the things you find out eventually is that there is no bottom. And that's a good thing. You get to keep learning, you get to keep growing, you get to keep changing, you get to keep evolving and becoming more effective. And what I see in this movement, and, and this is something that like, I, I'm so fortunate. Uh, my fiance Macy is here today. She's, well, hold on, hold on. She's the reason our last tour was possible because she did almost all of the drive. I mean, I can applaud. I guess you should applaud for just being my fiance, because that's you know, putting up with me. <laughs> but I, I'd like to think that from this experience that we had, we did 120 events in 180 days, roughly, that I have, if not the best, near the best, body of anecdotal data of how people wake up and how people become libertarians. And it's, it's you never hear, oh yeah, I lost a Facebook flame war and I realized I was wrong about everything. <laughs> and I can, I mean, I can give a whole other speech on, on how people are waking up in the process of saying, what? The psychology of it? Intertwined with history? That there is a phase shift in human understanding happening right now? And we get to be a part of this? But from that body of anecdotal data, there's some things that I'm able to extrapolate. And some things that I can see in this that I, that I like to share, especially with this audience, the hardcore activists, the people that make sure the comms are in the right place. 
just kidding, you guys. This is, I, I really like, part of why this is such an honor is because you're the ones that get things done. And it's, it, there are a lot of people outside of the party who consider themselves part of the movement who will talk trash about this. And, and you know, from, from my audience, from the, the harder core parts of the movement, you see a complete dismissal of politics. But this is where change happens. This is, this is how you actually go and communicate with people outside of this movement. This is how we encourage this convergence to happen. And I don't mean to say there's so, there's so much else outside of politics. That this is beyond the conversation about libertarianism. This is about spiritual evolution and living more free and technology empowering us. But th what you guys get done here, in, in many ways, is the tip of the spear. And not here, not at the convention. I mean, when you're out running for office, when you're out doing actors, when you're out talking to people. But the convergence, that what I'm really able to extrapolate from the state of set. You know what, when I look around the room, when I, when I meet people at events like this, I can tell who sees this. And I think it's more people every time, every time we come together, who see what I'm about to to try to share with you as part of my vision, which is that there's an inevitability to what we're doing. You see this in the way that people wake up. Well, first I was pissed off because of this, and then I was angry because of that, and then they, then I got a parking ticket, and that was the last straw, and then I started reading off art. <laughs> Okay, so maybe, maybe you just have to turn on my YouTube channel or something like that, but... The convergence, there's a process that people go through, and, and if you're here, you've probably already got a sense of this, so I'm probably not telling you anything that you don't already know, but I want, I want to tease it out and really capture... Is this enough to lead up to what I'm trying to say here? That we are all going through the same process. We are all coming to the same conclusion because we are all human. We all have an individual will. We all want to be free. We all want to be able to love our fellow human beings and interact with each other peacefully. We all want to thrive. We all see the injustice in the world and somewhere we all want to do something about it. And the convergence driven by technology and information and awareness and what makes events like this possible, coming together. What we see now is this incredible sense of destiny. And it's because everyone, every last human being on the planet already gets this and is capable of eventually putting it together and figuring out what we have figured out that has brought us here today. So, the title of this talk, which was kind of a throwaway working title, is Our Historic Opportunity. And I think here the assumption of that is I'm going to be talking about strategy for 2016, right? Come on, I hope you don't do better than that. Our historic opportunity is not 2016. It's not the fact that Clinton and Trump are the presumptive nominees, and that voter dissatisfaction is higher than ever because it's always the case. Since the foundation of the party, it's gotten worse and worse. There hasn't been a year where we've been like, oh, well, the mainstream parties put together some good candidates and campaigns this year. I guess we'll just tag in. But no, that's not the opportunity. Now, I don't know when this opportunity started or when this moment started. Some would take it back to the foundation of the party to the 70s. Some would take it back to the writings of Rothbard or Mises or Spooner or whoever your favorites are going back. Some would take it to Socrates and it starts with a question. 
And I didn't mean to do this with my YouTube videos, going out and doing man on the street stuff, but someone, someone told me in a comment, you know, oh my gosh, you're, the, you're like the modern day soccer team. So I was like, oh, whoops. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess maybe, maybe asking questions is an effective way to share the message. But it's, humanity, by its very nature, always asking questions, seeking better understanding, seeking improvement, seeking progress. And one of the things that I think is unique about the perspective that I bring, having been a, a full-time uh, I mean, activist for the last uh, eight years, is that I get to spend a lot of time thinking about these things and answering those bigger questions and, and putting together a more complete worldview. And one of the things, again, like the sense of inevitability that, I, that I'd like to share with you is how what we're doing is part of an incredible course of human progress throughout history. It's, not even, it's even bigger than humanity itself. That's in the nature of life, of increasing complexity and survival and reproduction, and tied to that which inherently makes us human. And one of the things that's, that's so beautiful about this, in, in comparison to you know, the, the old parties and, and the old political ideologies, is it, it, I don't know if you notice this, but there's an absence of something that's very important to those, the, the old parties. It's guilt and shame, and duty, and obligation. You don't hear a lot of that crap here, do you? If, if we don't raise our pitchforks now with a thousand years of tyranny and darkness, then we have to go defeat Obama and Trump and Clinton and blah, 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 right? And if you don't side with me, you're wrong. Why do we not engage in that kind of heady, emotional bullying? <laughs> When, you, when you're talking about this. This message is love. As, as Robin said earlier today, it's because you care about people, it's not about ideas. You know, a lot of us came here, and, and I'm, I'm part of this too. I, I was a libertarian as a member of Rock Runners Against the War, and the reason I became a real libertarian is because, well, I know I'm a libertarian, so I know I'm right about everything, I just have to prove it. And that's what led me to a deeper understanding. And when it's not about guilt and shame, it's about opportunity. And it's about love. There's no mandate. And a lot of people who come to this movement with the fear of some calamity, themselves burning out. I don't know if you've been around long enough to see their actors who get involved in this movement, and they're motivated by anger, they're motivated by a desire to be right about everything, to win every argument, and never win a single convert, just keep pushing people away. But you who stick around know that there's something more to this. You have to find a positive motivation if you really want to stick with this. What we have is not a mandate or a duty or an obligation. When you see this progression towards a free society as the inevitable course of human history, and that you want to participate in this, do you want to forward this, do you want to be on the front lines? It's because of love. And as Ron Paul said, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. And I guarantee you, having, having been to a couple, uh, having been to a DNC and an RNC, we are having a lot more fun here. So our historic opportunity is this turning point in human history. In the same way that we look back on the nameless primitives who invented the, the, the wheel 
who first made fire. Someday, perhaps from another planet, there will be human beings looking back at us as the generation who wielded the internet and brought down government. That is an incredible moment to appreciate. To see, this might be the single most important shift in human history, from statism to freedom. That day that we decided once and for all, don't hurt people, don't take their stuff, was a really good idea, and we should, we should try to apply that a little more consistently. And it's not a day, but it is a moment. And like I said, I don't know when it starts, but it ends with the abolition of all institutionalized violations of the non-aggression principle. It ends, it ends with the universal assertion of ethics and morality. It ends with a new era a beginning of a new age of prosperity and peace and harmony for humanity. So, our historic opportunity is not this convention, it's not this election, it's not running for office. It's the decisions that you make on a daily basis and the way that you live by these values. It's the way that you interact with people and share this beautiful, empowering message out of love and compassion. It's not about the conversations you're going to have here. It's about the conversations that you're going to have with your families and your friends and your communities when you go home. That is our historic opportunity. So it's worth, in light of this, I, I hope to take note of who we are right now as a movement. And I know all of us INTJ white males who are standing for Ron Paul in our parents' basements are starting to learn how to talk to normal people now. So <clears throat> the demographics of the movement are shifting a little bit. But it is important to appreciate who we are. Because it's not the captains of the football teams or the cheerleader squads or the student body presidents who are the first to challenge the status quo and question the system. We are the outcasts, the misfits, the downtrodden, the victims of the system, the square pegs and the round holes, the dreamers. And this is our time! <laughs> this is our moment in history. stories that humans have told of over the millennium, of all the cheesy Hollywood movies, of all the silly plots where the people like us are the ones who save the day, right? This is it for reals! This is our moment. This is our historic opportunity, and this is why it is truly an honor to share this moment with you. Thank you very much.
Then we'll go anywhere just yet. Someone who's having less fun than me here, because he's actually getting stuff done. Daniel Hayes has a few words to say, but um, if you uh, didn't already get your registration bag, please pick one up. Uh, we donated a copy of my book for every single registration bag, so I hope you appreciate it. And a couple of things in there that are very important that I think uh, I especially want to be able to share with, with this group here at the convention is this idea of personal empowerment and moving forward and seeing how technology puts this in historical perspective. And uh, so if you didn't get one, they're behind the registration desk. I'm speaking at 10 a.m. tomorrow in room 11 upstairs. And uh, if you want anything more about me, about anything I'm doing or plugging into what we've got going on, it's thefreedomline.com. Thank you very much.